She had a great smile. <laughs> we did a lot as a family. Uh, we went camping all the time, boating on the lake. She was really a, a typical kid, very, uh, very involved at, at school. She was a cheerleader and a competitive dancer and a black belt in Taekwondo, and I was there for all of it. I took every chance I could get to be the homeroom mom and be there for the parties and the field trips. Um, I just tried to stay involved at all times, and I think that helped you know, build that relationship. So from a young age, I was there. When Casey was 14, uh, about 14, is when we started to see uh, signs that things were going wrong. Stealing a few beers at a slumber party with friends, smoking weed. My husband and I, we, we did the typical things. You take away the cell phone and you, and you ground her. As a parent, I don't think that I took it that seriously at the time. I thought, she's a teenager. She's doing things that most of us did. Then maybe around 15, Ish. She was starting to dabble in pills, opioids. Did I believe that it would lead to heroin and all the horror that goes with addiction? No. Then she actually came back to me and said, I have a problem and I need help. We tried to get her help, uh, therapists and counselors. It's really hard to hand your child over to somebody else and say, fix them. By the time we realized uh, how bad it was, you know, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, she was already in so deep, so we did get her into rehab right away, um, and we had hoped that would be enough. As things progressed and outpatient therapy was not working, she did graduate high school, and we were hoping for a fresh start, but she, she was just getting worse. She would say that, you know, I just, I wanna make you proud again and she would be so devastated by guilt and shame when she would relapse. I, I would explain to her that every time you try again, you make me proud. I'm not disappointed in a relapse. I'm scared and I'm sad and I'm frustrated. I, I'm angry I'm I'm everything, but not at you. I, I'm mad at, at the addiction. The struggle with Casey affected myself, my husband, her brother, my son, so deeply. It was, that fear and that frustration of, we want to help Casey and we can't. You actually kind of become addicted to trying to save them. It was my own form of addiction, was worrying about her 24 hours a day. You talk about how people wait for that phone call. My phone never left my hand. She said, I don't have any money, and I wanna, I wanna get you something for Christmas. And I said, please, don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> and she went out and uh, bought a box and some craft material and painted it and bedazzled it, <laughs> decorated it. And in the box was a letter from her. And she said, I've been so depressed and upset lately that I can't get this right. She said, but now I have hope. She said, I really have hope. It was one of her favorite words. <laughs> Mine too. We were struggling to find a bed in rehab. Insurances got in the way. Uh, so we found a lot of obstacles there, unfortunately. And it's very frustrating to me because when an addict wants help, there should be no barriers ever. So she was continually keeping herself afloat, treading water. Uh, while she was waiting for rehab and packing. Uh, we had settled a rehab facility. And she was really excited about going and starting this new life. And unfortunately, she overdosed the night before. Literally sitting next to her packed suitcase. She had seen an honest obituary, what people would f refer to as an honest obituary of somebody who had died from addiction. And they stated that in the obituary. And she sent it to me. And uh, she said, did, did you read that link I sent you? She said, would you do that? She said, if something ever happened to me, would you be honest? She said, I would want you to. Um, she said, don't say suddenly. Don't say suddenly. Tell them my story. The secrets will help nobody. I wrote the obituary and it, 
it was so hard. One of the hardest things I've ever done. I just wanted to tell people how she never wanted her addiction to define her, that she was more than that. Uh, but I wanted to be honest. I had just posted it on my Facebook. I had never imagined the way it would go. I was getting messages from all over the country then from all over the world. The news started calling. So many people connected with this epidemic. Uh, Casey will always be special to me, but was she any more special than the other 64,000 people who died last year of an overdose? No, there's tragic stories everywhere. And I think, how can I inspire them and how can I give them hope? And I realized that they're the ones who inspire me. Because um, after I speak to them, they, uh, they let me know that they really, they heard me. They didn't just listen, they heard me. A lot of the messages I received uh, were families, some of them who lost their kids, people in addiction who said, I have Casey's obituary in my pocket and I read it and it keeps me going. Or I have Casey's obituary hanging in my mirror and I read it every morning. Or I read Casey's story and tomorrow I'm gonna seek treatment. My response was, don't wait till tomorrow, do it today. My job is to put a face behind some of those numbers and remind people that those 64,000 people, uh, they were somebody and they were loved. And there's other numbers that we need to embrace. And maybe if we start counting the number of people in recovery instead of the number of people in the morgue, you know, we could really start seeing a turnaround and, and give that hope more. I just feel that if I could do anything, to help one person, then all of this that's happened since Casey died would be worth it because there is no such thing as just one person. She really wanted to save everybody. Uh, she just couldn't save herself. I try to reach people and, and remind them that, you know, if you're still breathing, if you opened your eyes this morning, then you have that chance. Don't waste it. You know, where there's breath, there's hope.